Um, a very good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Um, you know, when uh, when we uh, study uh, in the kindergarten in schools, uh, the teacher used to always tell us repetition is the success of uh, retention in memory. Uh, and with that in, in mind, and also the fact that we're all here, and thank you all for coming uh, to, to commemorate the life and times and the legacy of Mr. Ian Dice of Essenia. I have the pleasure of reading for the third time bits of his uh, life story so that you will remember this for the next year before we meet again in the following year. In doing so, I have great pleasure and honor uh, to thank uh, Mr. Nihal Saniratna, the President Jitendra, who actually has been in touch with me on many occasions and been over there. Uh, for having been really the anchor person in making this a success. Uh, as you know, my life is uh, uh, not so busy one. And uh, um, when I get to read the tender's uh, emails and we know the emails is uh, first thing of the following morning. Uh, so let me go. Mr. Ian Das Abessing started his career in the early 60s at the Association Associated Motorways, AMW whose uh, president and the owner, his friend of mine is here, uh, and the U.S. are battery factory in Calathrae. He was nominated to follow a one-year intensive training program on automated battery manufacture at the U.S. works in Japan. Subsequently, he joined Brown & Company as their manager of Excite Battery, sales and service division, retired in 2012 in capacity as director of the battery division at Brown. In 1982, Ian was invited by the Association for Overseas Technical Scholarships. Japan established an alumni society affiliated to AOTS, and this, I suspect, is the result of all of his hard work. His term as president just tickles eventful with Sri Lanka receiving increased numbers of group training programs, workshops, and lecturing tours by eminent Japanese professors. The 5S and the quality circles were introduced by Japanese experts during this era and we all know about 5S. With foresight and vision, he laid a solid foundation for Justica to reach the prestigious position of being best alumni association of AOTS Japan, an honor indeed. The Japanese government, in recognition of his contribution to foster friendship and goodwill between Sri Lanka and Japan, honored him with the prestigious decoration of the Order of Rising Sun, Gold and Silver Rays. Yen, as, uh, as you all knew him, I had did not have the fortune of uh, meeting this wonderful gentleman, he was a very personable, friendly, and charming personality, full of wit and humor. He was an outdoor man and a wide had a wide circle of friends. He was vice president of the Gumbo Rifle Club, and I know much, many of them. They're all wonderful people, and an excellent sharpshooter and a keen fisherman when time permitted. He was a true friend and advisor to many and, and generous to afford people who worked under him. Jim is no more, but his legacy that is just a guy remains to serve our beloved country. And he is survived by his family. His son is Arjun, and I hope Arjun is in the midst of us here. We would love to meet you. Now, in keeping with, uh, with orations, uh, usually the time is about 45 minutes. Uh, I thank you all, ladies and gentlemen, for having uh, turned up on, uh, uh, on a Tuesday evening, having uh, withered the traffic in Colombo, and it really means that you mean a lot, and Ian Dice Abessinger means a lot to you. However, uh, I think I'm going to keep, with the permission if you will, sir, I'm going to keep this oration for much shorter than 45 minutes for many reasons. I think good things come in short packages, small packages. Uh, and also, I think the retention memory of the, the highest of intellectuals is about 15 minutes. And uh, that way, I think I can transfer as much as I can uh, to you in what is an important development in medicine and life, that is probiotics. Uh, and I know I will keep an eye on my wife over there because she's tired of uh, listening to me and hearing my voice. And no sooner she nods off, I'm going to see, say thank you for your attention. So with those things in mind, let me start off if I can get this on.
the development of probiotics, the good and bad effects of intestinal bacteria. Did you ever think that there might be good effects of intestinal bacteria or bacteria at all? Well, I'm here to tell you otherwise. Uh, but I'm also give you, going here to allude you to some real lifetime shocks of what goes on in the world. And that, I think, is important. If you look on the left side over there, that's what you would buy from your supermarket. Pieces of chicken, uh, broiled chicken grown in the farms of, uh, of, of all the parts of the world. But if you look on your right side, that looks a bit dicey. You wouldn't go for that piece of chicken. And that is because the black area has been gradually invaded by bacteria. So bacteria are present all across, uh, over us. They're, they're on our skins, they're in what we breathe. The only thing that we think that we don't have bacteria around us is because they are invisible. Uh, but if you leave that piece of chicken not sufficiently frozen uh, in the warmth of our tropics uh, and perhaps uh, improperly stored in supermarkets, that's what you're going to get. Uh, and a nasty piece of chicken that may not actually uh, be ready for human consumption. Now, when uh, a researcher called Melanie Warner from Money Watch, which is a uh, United States based uh, newspaper, uh, picked up the Food and Drugs Administration. The FDA in America is, uh, is the controlling body for all food and all drugs that come into America and are consumed by the people there. And what they stated in a small window of the FDA. Uh, website was there's an alarming amount of superbugs in our supermarkets. And what is a superbug? Well, it's like a superman. Uh, superbugs are bugs that are at a high level, they're more capable, they're more capable of destruction, they're more harmful than the usual bugs that you see. And that is exactly what uh, prompted the uh, window of the FDA report. Uh, here's what it said. Federal government report on antibiotic resistance reveals that superbugs in meat is a much more common and widespread problem than anyone would like to admit. This is in the United States of America, the country that we think is the best place in the world to live in. New strains of hearty antibiotic resistance salmonella, we know all, all about salmonella, Escherichia coli and Campylobacter bacteria, all of these are bacterial strains appear to be showing up in alarmingly high percentages of the chicken, the turkey, the pork and beef you buy at the supermarkets. And that was in 2011. McKenna, who was an author of a book about resistant, bacterial resistance to antibiotics, summed it all up. She said, in 2008, 45% of salmonella on chicken were resistant to the antibiotic called tetracycline. We all know tetracycline. 30% were immune to penicillins. Among the other bacteria, there was resistance reporting 65% and 90%. What are the superbugs then? How do they come up? This is how they happen. This is your chicken farm, and if you're the farmer, if you have one chicken sneezed, you'd be very worried, because you won't know where your dinner table is going to be come up at Christmas time, because all of those chickens will be dead. So what do they do? They lay all the chicken feed, all of the water that gets um, uh, served up to these chickens for hydration with antibiotics. The reason they do that is to prevent these chickens from developing an illness that would spread like wildfire in that chicken farm, in that brooding ground, and cause death. However, if you look at the alarming reports of the sale of antibiotics, you would think they were used for, the majority was used for human consumption. But in 2011, 80% of all antibiotics that were used in the USA was sold to the farming industry. So if the doctors like our GMO go on strike and the patients don't get any antibiotic at all, People who sell antibiotics won't be worse off because most of the antibiotic sales is to the animal husbandry um, industry. And that is true for most parts of the world. 
when I was a surgeon working in the United Kingdom, there was a very frank, forthright Minister of Health. I'm sure some of you would remember that name, Mrs. Edwina Curry. And what she found was a significant and alarming number of salmonella present in the eggs of this of the chicken that laid these eggs to be sold, and she mentioned that in Parliament. The following week, there was a huge drop across Britain of the sale of eggs. Now, Mrs. Curry had to uh, resign. She had to resign for being correct and for being politically incorrect. This, ladies and gentlemen, is the true world. This is the absolute true world. So I think it's important to be right and to be politically right. If we pushed her message for long enough, maybe we could have changed this whole thing around many years ago, but Mrs. Curry failed uh, for good reasons. So why do we sell antibiotics to the animal husbandry industry? It's because antibiotics are used in the animal husbandry to reduce the rate of cross-infection in animals found for meat, which is what I told you just about. For some unknown reason, when you put antibiotics into chicken feed, it seems to increase the growth of these farmed animals. And that is wonderful for the farming industry, isn't it? But the problem is that they do not put enough antibiotics to kill all the bugs. So that is why your doctor, if you see your GP for a bacterial infection, the GP will tell you, make sure you complete the course, even though you're feeling better. Because what happens if you don't complete the prescribed course is that you will kill off the weaker bacteria and the stronger bacteria will get even more stronger because there are methods by which they develop resistance and the next round of infection is going to result in resistance to the antibiotics that the doctor initially prescribed. Now, whilst I'm going to talk to you about the, the, the role of uh, low-level antibiotics and low-dose incorrectly uh, administered antibiotics, we must not forget, like Ian Dice Abessino is to us, there's this man called Alexander Fleming, who was a great man who developed penicillin, he discovered penicillin. He was a uh, sir, he, he was a microbiologist who worked at the famous St. Mary's Hospital in London. He lived and originated from Scotland and he came across stumbled upon penicillin all by accident. And here's the accident. That you see is a petri dish, is a dish with a culture medium for bacteria. The little white dots are the usual colonies of the growths of bacteria that will happen if you leave uh, this nutritious medium out there. So he left this medium and he went back to Scotland on the long weekend. The bank holiday long weekend in England is a three or four day holiday and they really have a great time. And by the time he came back, he found to his amazement there was a huge white blob that you see on the top of that dish. That white blob is a mold, in other words a fungus. And if you look carefully, we will observe what Alexander Fleming observed to his own eyes and that the bacteria in a radius across around the mold were absent and there was a the growth of bacteria furthest away from the mold indicating that there, this mold had some bacteria killing properties and this mold is what eventually turned out to be the fungus that produced penicillin. So in your, do you know in management they say that when life gets hard you can, there, are, there are silver linings of each cloud and, and, and you know that if you're given a lemon, you were told to make a lemonade out of that. In microbiological terms, when life gives you a mold, they say make penicillin out of it. When eventually, Dr. Fleming linked up with a scientist from Oxford and he had to now transfer this technology into one that really served the whole world. So the scientists from Oxford and some American scientists made up what is now a penicillin that is available for all of us to use. He received the Nobel Prize for it, and we know the Nobel Prize. And what he said is, when I woke up just after dawn on the 28th of September in 1928, I certainly 
did not plan to revolutionize all of medicine by discovering the world's first antibiotic, or bacteria killer, in short. But I guess that was exactly what I needed. In his Nobel Prize acceptance speech, Fleming warned that the overuse of penicillin, and for that matter, any antibiotic, might lead to bacterial resistance. That was in 28. We are now in 2017. Okay, and that's exactly what you see. So here you're seeing an electron microscope, a very fine microscope uh, view of a bacterial population. And this is exactly what happens when you use antibiotic in low doses. And where do you use that? In those chicken farms, in their food, in their water. It kills off those weak bacteria and it facilitates the growth of the bad guys. So what happens is actually uh, not only are the bad guys uh, killed off, you also get good bacteria in our guts. We develop the good bacteria as a result of during birth, when a baby is born through the mother's birth canal, we will acquire the bacteria that is present in the mother's birth canal. And these bacteria are actually good bacteria. They protect our gut. They protect, they are the first line of protection. So when you have something like a salmonella infested or infected ice cream, it's not all of us who will get it because our good bacteria will fight that fight to keep those bacteria away from entering our human uh, uh, body. So the good and the bad guys die off, but the ugly guys, which is the bad bacteria and the, and the resistance strains and the superbugs, will continue to survive and produce colonies or growths or populations of bacteria that really cannot be hit by antibiotics that were of that time. Hence the need for great amounts of, of antibiotics and different strains and different strengths and newer antibiotics. Every time bacteria see or match up against antibiotics, you can be sure that they will develop a new strain that will face the fight with antibiotics. So the question is, are there good bacteria, really? And I'm answering yes. What you're seeing in that image is your intestinal epithelium, again, in the uh, electron microscope structure, you see those cells are very tightly knitted together. It's like all these riot police commandos sticking together to prevent any of those water bombs or any of the stones that go through them. So on the outside there, you see that little layer right up there, and that layer is our good bacteria. For some reason, let's for instance, on this occasion, say you've had Edwina Curry's egg with salmonella in it, or you've had um, a little bit of chicken with a superbug in it, the entire bacterial population is now ready to enter or invade that, that barrier that was sharply created because of the salmonella infection. And then the whole of your body is exposed to the dangerous effects of bacteria. So this is what uh, bacteria do. How can you then, so what I've shown you is a leaky gut and what you, what you can develop is a leaky gut by cross-contamination. This is where we can go wrong. What happens, most of us who have this piece of chicken that we want to slice up in a hurry on a Sunday for the roast, also have it on the same cutting board as we have our lettuce, as we have our potatoes, and some of that juice from a not so well stored piece of chicken or meat from the supermarket can sneakily leak into that piece of lettuce which you're now going to consume raw, perhaps with some salt or vinegar in it. And that's when you get the super by getting to you. And once that superbug gets into you, it's going to create this leaky gut. That is, it's going to dismantle, because it's a powerful bug, it will dismantle the barrier that the commandos have created for you, your good bacteria. So here's a few tips for you homemakers and all of us who care to make our food at home. It is important to make sure that you do not allow the juices associated with raw meat and poultry to contaminate other areas of your kitchen. Please clean utensils and cutting boards thoroughly to prevent this contamination because bacteria can survive. Always store raw meats on the bottom of our refrigerator. Now that's not what we do, do we? Our meats are stored right on top, the lettuce is stored right at the bottom, and when raw meats thaw, 
they can drip their juices with the superbugs on the lettuce. So perhaps we should be rethinking uh, methods of how we can prevent leaky gut. That is how you hear tragic deaths in young people from a bacterial infection. Of course, you blame only one person for that. That is a doctor because he didn't give you the right treatment. But that's not true. So how do good bacteria protect humans? Now, this next century, or next 10 years, if not century, is going to teach us more about how these bacteria support us and how we prevent damage from the bad bacteria that are present all across us. And that is because of technology. We have better methods, better tools, and better everything to be able to identify these bacteria. So much so that you will realize that this current epidemic of obesity or being overweight across the world might be related to your gut bacteria. I'm not going to tell you how, that's something for further reading, but in, the, in keeping with the oration, I can see my wife's uh, left eye nodding off, so uh, I'll try and get through this quickly. Or you can have gut bacteria having control over your moods and brain function. So some days when you're driving the car and you're feeling like on top of the world, and other days when you think, oh, what's going on? I'm, I'm, I'm not feeling like getting back, back to work at all. Maybe you've got bacteria causing it, because these bacterial populations have changed. And probably it's what you have eaten the previous night, or you probably had some antibiotics for a virus, totally inappropriate infection that may have changed your gut bacteria. So think gut bacteria. And we're beginning to see that colon cancer, bowel cancer, can also be manipulated and originated from alterations of your bacteria, bacteria in the gut. That is because your good guys have been decimated by whatever your lifestyle has been. Come to the four probiotics, the path to a happy belly. And what are probiotics? Well, I'm pleased that this is to do with uh, Japan because there was a Japanese physician who lived in the 1800s uh, who uh, thought that bacteria in our gut that protect ourselves can be developed to a point where we can produce drinks that will get people to, we can get people to have, perhaps it have, will have commercial value, and we can protect our bacteria, our guts from the bacteria that invade us by reinforcing. It's like they would send reinforcements from the army headquarters when your, your platoon has been knocked out by the terrorists. We can reinforce uh, our guts with the good bacteria. And that's the man. His name is Minoru Shiroto, born in August 1899. He was born to a wealthy family in a city of Japan called Nagota. Nagota and he spent hours researching what we find here. This is taken from the website of uh, Yakult and says that Shiroda was at his studies in the spring of 1925. On the advice of his boss, Professor Kiyono, he continued his research of interest to microbiologists. In his research, he found that dangerous bacteria enter the body to cause disease such as dysentery. We know that. Also, he found that in the human stomach, there were beneficial bacteria that protected health and that fight against harmful bacteria. That's in the 1800s, mind you. Lactobacillus bacteria are examples of good bacteria in the human stomach. Shirota aimed to find lactobacillus bacteria from nature and to propagate and strengthen it in a drink. In this way, harmful bacteria, he thought, can be eliminated and natural health can be maintained. So, Eureka, Shirota manufactures Yakult. And Yakult has been around as a probiotic agent for many, many years before the rest of us in the other parts of the world, including America, actually picked on the idea of Yakult. Of course, we have had this for a long time, even before Nagota produced it. It was produced in Kanteli. That is our probiotic. And you all know, that's the curd. We have buffalo curd that is a natural probiotic, same as we have in our yogurts. The only problem with this is that the top end is what we all like to have, and that has got the fat in it, which gives us drives and diarrhea. What you should be going for is the whey bit of the curd that is at the bottom. So I'm suggesting that you enjoy the top a little bit, but enjoy most of the bottom that has the bacteria in it that would 
strengthen your good bacteria. Of course, probiotics come in capsules these days, and it's not a bad idea actually to uh, to reinforce your gut, just like we do with vitamins, with both the natural and the capsule evidence of uh, probiotics, because the probiotics with, that come in the capsules and are not uh, selling from pharmaceutical agency, they have the concentrations of bacteria that can make the difference. You have to have many, many pots of curd and therefore get ill before you get that right bit of bacteria. So there it is. Now, just in summary, if you want to know how researchers are beginning to find that gut bacteria affects the brain and body, it affects the way you think. We are beginning to think that there is an association between depression and the gut bacteria that we have. We're beginning to think that there is an association between anxiety and the bacteria that we harbor in our guts. We're beginning to think that there is an association between a lot of the other diseases such as cancer, uh, the rheumatoid diseases, psoriasis, uh, irritable bowel syndrome, ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease that you might have heard your friends have. All of that from just having the bad, not so good bacteria in our gut. So what has happened to all of our good bacteria? Well, we've wasted it all for eating the wrong thing. So it's important to uh, think, start thinking mature again, take responsibility for our own actions. And ladies and gentlemen, because this is just a gap, I would like to now put in my last slide of this beautiful Japanese doll dating century and give you goodbye saying, Arigatou gozaimasu. Thank you.